Turn with us to chapter 16. We're going to continue in, in our uh, series that we've been in, in in 1 Corinthians. And today, uh, we're preaching what's next. <laughs> we're preaching what's next. And you'll understand why I, say, why I said that when we read these verses today. Because uh, we're looking today on the idea of the truth of Christian giving. <laughs> you know, the devil's been trying to keep me for several weeks from preaching this. Uh, and I've... Uh, <laughs> I've come to understand I haven't been faithful in preaching this. I've allowed my fears of what people may say to keep me away from something God thought was so important that we find it so often in his scripture. And I pray that I never... I never avoid the truth of his scripture again. We're going to look in verses 1 through 3 for our reading in chapter 16. Um, while you'll get in there. I, I read of two close friends. One an Orthodox Jew. The other a Christian. And they talked about their beliefs in such a way to where they decided they would go to each other's place of worship. The Christian shared with his Jewish friend that he would go with him first to a synagogue. While there during the service, they had a time of worship through giving. The Christian watched his Jewish friend pull a check out of his pocket and place it in an offering plate. When he saw the check as it went by him, he turned to his Jewish friend and asked, is this one week's offering or a full month's offering? His friend shared, you know I'm an Orthodox Jew. And the Old Testament tells us that we are to give one-tenth of all that we make back to the Lord. I, I thought you Christians done the same thing. The Christian's reply was, oh no, we've been freed. And we're no longer bound by the law. So the Jew, Jewish friend asked the Christian, well, what do you do when it comes time for offerings? And the Christian replied, oh, it's simple. At the end of the week, we give what's left over. May God have mercy. Now, I can honestly say that the Christian friend had failed to gain a proper understanding of Christian giving. Or what some would call grace giving. Yes, he was correct in that we are no longer bound by a legalistic way of giving. However, that does not mean we have the privilege of offering God our leftovers. According to Matthew 5 and 17, Jesus did not destroy the law or the prophets. Instead, he came to fulfill the law and prophecy. We can't forget how God accepted the sacrifice of Abel, but he rejected the leftovers of Cain. In 1 Corinthians, we find Paul helps us to understand the truth. Of Christian giving. The Bible says this. Now concerning the collection for the saints. As I have given orders to the church 
of Galatia, so that you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. This is God's holy word. God, as we come before you today, we pray that you would move in our midst. God, as you have been moving throughout this service, we pray that you would continue to move in our midst. That you would open our hearts and our minds. That you would, that you would receive glory and honor in all that's said and done. That you would take the broken words that would be said and fix them, form them, fashion them in our hearts. God, the word we would be edified from your word. That you would be glorified and your son would be magnified. And we'll praise you for all that's accomplished. God, if there's one who doesn't know you through your son, Jesus Christ, we pray that today would be a day that they would see their need for a savior and they'd call out, what must I do to be saved? For God, we know we can trust you for your faithful. You're faithful to forgive them of their sins and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. So now, God, you have your way in this service and we give you honor for it all. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul's letter doesn't seem to reveal whether there was a problem with the Corinthian believers giving. However, it does appear that there may have been questions among some of the believers as to how they should be given in support of ministry. So Paul shares with all the Corinthian church as well as the churches in Galatia instructions on stewardship. And we, because we find here in verse 1, Paul says, As I have given orders to the churches in Galatia, so you must do also. Possibly, this is due to the Corinthian church being encouraged to help the church in Jerusalem due to a financial hardship that they were facing. Well, the fact that Paul is addressing Christian giving implies that there's a misunderstanding when it comes to Christian giving. Can I stop right there for a moment? You know, I'm proud of our church. <laughs> I'm proud of the way that we have been giving to the Lord. We've been going through a pandemic for the past 18 months or longer. With six months outside of the church, where the only services we saw from here was through a recorded device. Due to the pandemic, we have put on hold some activities that we would normally be doing. We've even had to change how we do certain ministries that we had done before. We've been challenged these past 18 months. But in the past two years, we've collected more money in gifts and offerings and tithes than we ever had. Why don't we stand and just praise God? Just praise God for his faithfulness. He has blessed us. He has given to us. And you have been faithful in your giving also. So today I know I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> I know I'm preaching to the choir. In my 16 years plus of being here, we've not collected what we've collected in the past two years. And this year was more than last year. God deserves all praise for that. And I commend you. I commend you for that. And I've shared over uh, several times throughout this series in 1 Corinthians that I'm not preaching through these issues because these issues are currently dividing us. No, I'm going through these issues so that we are aware that these issues do exist. 
And that we don't allow these issues to, to divide us. We are a church family and we need to always be reminded that there's someone out there trying to destroy the family. It's not just the family in our homes, but it's in this family also. The world is wanting to destroy it. So I believe God has placed this burden of 1 Corinthians in my heart to share with you so that we would be a light on the hill right here in this community. That when people see and they hear from us, that they see God and they hear from God. Listen, folks, I don't know if you're aware of all that God's doing, but he's doing a great work when other churches or, or other pastors are wanting to use our ministries to, and when they're going to go minister to others. And, and God, it's, it's just a blessing that God has, has given us. And, and for me to be jealous or afraid of that, it would be foolish because I know where we were and I know what God's doing now. And, and I've got a vision of what he's going to do in the future. So we're going to trust him. We're going to trust him. When we. God has been good. God has been faithful. But there is a reality. That we have to admit to. And that reality is there's a misunderstanding in Christian giving. Now, there may not be here, or there may be. And we just want to take some time to clear this up. The reality, the misunderstanding to how Christians are to give, uh, it's a real thing. Initially, we think of the tithe, and usually the next thought is just as that illustration was earlier that that we think, well, we're no longer under the law, so we're not bound to give the tithe. And, and there are many believers who believe that the tithe, it just no longer apl applies to the New Testament Christian. And, this, and with this, there's this feeling of no obligation to give. And in essence, God is being robbed. The book of Malachi, in his book, we find that God spoke through the prophet to Israel. And God asked, will a man rob God? And then he says, yet you have robbed me. Israel was guilty of failing to bring their tithes and offerings to the temple of God so that there would continually be meat in the temple. God even went as far as to tell Israel, if you would just test me or try me, you would see that I would be faithful to you if you were faithful to me and I'll open up the windows of heaven and I'll pour out a blessing upon you. Though God is speaking of tithes and offerings, this still does apply to the Christian in giving as well. When we use the excuse to give to God our leftovers because we're no longer under the law, we're twisting God's word. We're being deceitful of God's word. Second Corinthians 9, 6 through 7 shares that we should give faithfully from God's blessings. However, we should not give out of necessity, nor should we give grudgingly, but we should give cheerfully for giving to God is an act of worship. And God loves a cheerful giver. So when we twist God's word in our Christian giving, we're robbing God of our worship. For forgiving is a portion back to God is of what we've been blessed with is our way to submit and obey the one true God. The one God and the only God that we can trust our lives with. When we twist the word of God in our Christian giving, we're also robbing the house of God. I want, us, I want us to be very clear with this. God don't need our money. Amen. Psalm 50, 10 through 12, he says this, For every beast in the fo of the forest is mine, and the cattle of a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in all its fullness. God doesn't need our money. It's not about him needing our money. It's about us needing him and obeying him. 
If we're going to worship God in a place like this, though, there are expenses that have to be paid. We like water, heat, air, insurance, curriculum. We must remember a ministry cost. It costs our time, our talents, and our treasure. And if Reedy Branch is going to continue to do ministry, we can't twist God's word when it comes to Christian giving. Because when we twist God's word in our Christian giving, we are robbing also ourselves. We're not just robbing God. We're not just robbing his house of worship. We're robbing ourselves. God has promised he will pour out a blessing upon us. And the problem is that that, it, that, that leads to us giving out of the wrong heart. Some are looking for monetary blessings in return, but we need to remember that after God says in Malachi that he would pour out his blessings upon us, verse 11 says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Folks, I don't know if we really understand that, but I want to tell you, I want to tell you that, that this is a great blessing to us. And really what he's saying, you give me 10% and I will give you 90 and I'll rebuke the devourer and he'll do more with the 90 in our lives than what we could do with 100 in our lives. How's that preacher? Well, if he rebukes the devourer, then maybe we don't have as many doctor bills. Maybe we don't have as many legal fees. Maybe we don't have unexpected breakdowns of appliances, vehicles, and other costly items. Maybe we don't have to experience that. And if those things doesn't happen, if we don't have those breakdowns, we have more money to do what we want to do with. Amen. Keep in mind how much of a blessing that really is because if he can rebuke the devourer he can release the devourer we will not rob God and enjoy what belongs to God for ourselves it won't happen really branch we can't afford we can't afford to misunderstand Christian giving we can't twist God's word and justify giving God our leftovers. He has blessed us and we are to give according to how he has blessed us. So the question becomes, what is the remedy? What's the remedy to the reality of misunderstanding? Well, it can be found here in this text. Paul shares with the, that the Corinthian believers had a purpose for giving. The collection that they were going to receive, it was going to be used to minister to the saints in the church in Jerusalem. It appears that the church in Jerusalem had been experiencing a difficult, a difficult time. We're not sure exactly what was going on in Jerusalem. Perhaps uh, what we do know is this. This is what we know, is that after Pentecost, the believers in Jerusalem at that time, they got together and said, we're going to have all things in common. They got together and said, we're going to sell property, we're going to sell goods, we're going to put it all in a basket, and we're going to do, uh, give it out, and we're going to do this so that no one goes lacking. So it's possible, uh, through the years after, that they exhausted their resources helping everyone. It's possible that a famine came and contributed to deplete their, source, their resources. It's also possible that persecution of the church was a cause of them depleting their resources. Whatever the reason, and we can't pinpoint it to say exactly what it is, but whatever that reason was, the church in Jerusalem was in need. So Paul encouraged the churches to establish, to find, that he established to financially help the church in Jerusalem. This gave purpose for Christian giving. So for you and I, I would, uh, why should we give cheerfully out of God's blessings that he's given toward us? Why, why would we do this? We should want the work of the Lord to continue to move forth out of this place. Let's get real for a moment. In order for us to be a New Testament church, 
worship, evangelism, discipleship, missions, and fellowship are ministries that have to go out of our church. If those five ministries don't go out of our church, we're not a New Testament church. These ministries have to take place, and it takes people, it takes resources, it takes money for it all to happen. We give cheerfully for a purpose, and that purpose is so that the Lord's work continues to go forth from Reedy Branch Baptist Church so that we can take part in the building of the kingdom of God. That's the purpose. But Paul also shares there should be a plan in our giving. In verse 2, Paul, Paul encourages the Corinthian believers to lay aside on the first day of the week. Paul didn't want them to be rushed in taking up an offering when he arrived. Instead, he, he wanted them to, to have this taken up. He wanted them to be in the habit of giving in a specific way so that when he came, then the money would be there available. He didn't want people to be put on the spot. He didn't want them to feel pressured into having to give because they hadn't been accustomed to giving. So he shares with them a, a plan for giving and that is on the very first day of the week on the Lord's day that they would give a portion of what they had I, I, I want to share this with us uh, we know that the Jewish Sabbath falls on the last day of the week however the Christian church we we worship on the Lord's day the first day of the week it, it commemorates the, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who, who was out of the tomb early on the first day of the week and perhaps Paul is reminding the believers that as they plan to worship, they should plan to include giving as a part of their worship. And perhaps you have a similar plan. Perhaps, I, I don't know, it's not my job to know, and I don't really want to know. Uh, but perhaps your plan, whether it's the first day of the week or whether it's bi-weekly or whether it's monthly, you give out of when you get paid. And if whatever your plan is, then that's between you and God and you need to have a plan. That's the important thing here is that we have a plan. We shouldn't give occasionally. We should be committed to give consistently to the Lord. And that takes a plan. And last we notice in verse 2 that Paul says, let each of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper. Here Paul is asking everyone to participate. And for everyone to participate, we can't expect everyone to give equally. You know... <laughs> Being equal does not mean the same. My wife and I, we're equal in our, in our marriage. We're equal. I'm not above her. She's not above me. She gets her way a little more than I do, but, but we're equal. And, but we're not the same. You look at her and tell we're not the same. Yeah. I don't want the same. It, I wasn't created to have the same. <laughs> I'll let that sink in for a little bit. When we think about giving, we can give equally, but it may not be the same. How does that take place, preacher? Well, if we give proportionately, we can give equally, though it may not be the same. In other words, we give according to how we've been blessed. Well, you may ask, well, where do I begin with giving proportionately? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that. Why don't we just start with where God said it was a good place to start? He said it was a good place at a tithe, didn't he? He, he, he said 10% was a good place to start why don't we just make that our starting place you know for some I know that that that's gonna come at a great sacrifice and God will honor the sacrifice but that should be our starting place that shouldn't be the standard because there's some that can do much more 
And so the starting place should never be the standard. It should be just where we get started. Uh, we, when we give proportionately, it, it's going to, it will cause us to ask the question, how long? How long do we stay at this starting place? Well, that depends. That really depends <laughs> on how much we trust God with every aspect of our lives. Hmm. You know, Henry Kroll, founder of the Quaker Oats Company, received Christ as his savior as a young man. When he began his career in business in a little Ohio factory, he promised God he would honor him with his giving. God's blessing was upon him in a tremendous way. We're still eating products of that factory. His business grew, and as his business grew, his giving increased. After more than 40 years of giving 60% of his income to God, he testified to this. I've never gotten ahead of God. He's always ahead of me in giving yes it appears that Crowell Crow, he understood the importance of giving with a purpose he purposed to honor God with his business but he also understood the importance of giving of having a plan for giving so he committed to increase his giving to the Lord as his business grew and he also understood giving proportionately. As God richly blessed his company for more than 40 years, he gave 60% of his earnings to the Lord. Now, we may never get to that place financially. I wish we could. <laughs> but I've learned this. If I'm not faithful over giving 10%, I'm not going to be faithful over giving 20%. I've learned if I'm not faithful in giving, if I get $200 a week, I won't be faithful in giving if I get 200000 a week. Somebody should have said amen. amen. We may never get there, and that's fine. That is fine. We, I'm not suggesting that we should get the 60%. That's not what I'm suggesting. God, because God's not interested in the portion in which we give. God's more interested that we give proportionately to how he's blessed us. One thing is sure. If we fail to give with purpose. If we fail to have a plan for giving. If we can't trust God to give proportionately. Then we'll never be the cheerful giver that Mr. Crowell was. And that God would desire us to be. So my question to us today, and again, I commend you, I commend you. As a matter of fact, in, this, in the over 16 years I've been here, every year, the giving in this church has increased. It hasn't went backwards at any time. I commend you. I truly do. But my question is this for us personally, not as a church, but personally. Do we trust God enough to give with purpose? Do we trust God with a plan for giving? And do we trust God enough to give proportionately? As every head's bowed and every eye's closed. Many of you who are part of this church can honestly say, yes, I trust God in my giving. But by the chance, by the chance that there might be someone who struggles with this. I want to encourage you today. To seek God's face. To help you to trust and obey. 
in your giving with purpose to honor him. I would encourage you today to seek God to help you trust and obey him in having a plan for giving. And I would encourage you to seek God to help you trust and obey in giving proportionally. As born-again believers, Christian giving is a blessing. I have found in my time, in my life, that I'm fared out a whole lot more when I've been consistently given to Him than when I was keeping it for myself. God loves us and God wants to bless us. He desires to bless us. And I believe, I, as I look around our church, He is blessing. He's not just the church. He's blessing the homes that come to this church. He is blessing. And I, I know He's moving in, in your hearts and your lives. And you give out of how He has blessed you. I, I, I know that. I'm sure of that. But it just might be a struggle for someone. Right now is your chance to talk with him. And I would encourage you to continue to talk with him. And continue to seek the, his help for you to be more faithful. But if, we're, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior. I pray that you would seek him to help you. To trust him with your life. Trust, seek him to help you trust him with your soul. Seek him to help you to just take the one step that you need to take. So that you can trust that he'll do the rest. I promise you, if you will step out in faith, he'll meet you. You won't have to go to him. He'll meet you right where you step. You give your heart to Jesus and then let Jesus deal with your heart with everything else. 